name is Tina Ruggieri. I am the assistant curator at the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm excited to be here today with artist Charo Oquette. Charo is one of the 37 artists in Ava's current exhibition, A La Carte, A Visual Exploration of Our Relationship with Food. Um, Charo is a multidisciplinary artist living and working in Miami, Florida. Her artistic practice incorporates the visual and the performing arts inspired by her travels all over the world. She challenges stereotypes of African Americans and working with the decolonization narratives and aesthetics within her work. Today, Charo is going to give us a little more insight into her two photographs, or really large format Polaroids, currently featured in a la carte. Charo, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Tina. It's very very honored to be part of this exhibition. Um, it's, yeah, I wish I could go up there. But, you know. <laughs> me too. Okay. One of my first questions that I always like to ask artists, because every artist has a different background story. And so how did you become interested in art and becoming a visual and performing artist? Um, I think, you know, from very early, I knew I was an artist since mm -hmm. I was like age 12, I'd say, I identify as an artist. Um, and I think it happened because I, I'm the, from the Dominican Republic and my father was a high ranking military officer and he was moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. So we moved schools a lot and um, I would just draw a lot in my, in my notebooks. I would get into his classroom, which I knew nothing about it. You know, I was like behind whatever. And I would just draw, 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 but nobody ever saw my drawings. Uh, but when I came to America, age 10, I had um, really my first art class, you know, that, I mean, you know, I was in Catholic schools and you did draw them, but there wasn't like art classes. And mm -hmm. I can remember that my art teacher really loved my drawings. And she was like, oh my God, these are so good. And before that, everything was bad in me. Like in the, as far as school like you know mm -hmm. I was behind I you know I, I stuttered I I had a lot of problems because I was you know moving and then we migrated so it was very hard and this was the first thing that was like a really positive thing and yeah. from there on I became the classroom artist I, you know <laughs> I couldn't speak English very well or anything um, and I was adapting but I used to decorate the walls for the teachers and and it became like my identity you know and then I went back to the Dominican Republic because my parents returned after the, like a six year exile. Mm -hmm. And I took myself to the Fine Art Academy that I found mm -hmm. that was free. And I went in there and I said, Amazing. I wanted, I wanted, yeah, just by myself, I was 16. I went to the art, nobody told me go, you know, I found out about it. I went and they said, well, do you have a portfolio? And I said, well, I don't, didn't know what a portfolio was, but <laughs> yeah. I said, I have this drawing book that I'm always carrying around and drawing. And they looked at it and said, fine. And so I, I uh, enrolled myself in the, in the afternoon to this fine art academy that was very like, you know, fine arts, uh, sort of, you know, drawing and, and, and all that. And then I had to stop uh, when I graduated high school. And then I enrolled myself in the evenings to classes, mm -hmm. um, art classes. So, and also in high school, when I went back to the Dominican Republic, um, you know, as a migrant, um, we were first here in New Jersey and my parents didn't speak English. We were in a very working class environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, although we'd come back every year to the Dominican Republic and all that. But when I went back to the Dominican Republic, I went to this American overseas school and the school was um, was a very posh school. It was a, yeah. where the Dominican oligarchy was, the embassies and, you know, the children of that kind of stuff. And here I am with this really heavy duty New York accent, you know, everybody <laughs> yeah. was like going to go to Yale, you know, they had a very fine American accent. And so again, art was my savior there, yeah. you know, it was my identity it was a thing that I could do really well, that better than most people. And I remember having a teacher who loved my, 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 my artwork and, you know, my whole performance stuff. And, and so, you know, as I said, um, you know, art from there since, very early was part of my who I was and what yeah. I could do that was different from anyone else. So yeah. I think that's what's, you know, why I've kept doing art yeah. all my life. You, know? you just found who you were really early in life, but it also sounds like it was 
um, also like a universal language, you know, because you were a transplant into the US and you had, you didn't know English, you had to learn English. So it's kind of a universal way to work through a lot of those things and have people help understand where you're coming from. Um, right. as a person. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, especially because I, I used to stutter. I was a mm -hmm. very heavy stutterer and it got better when I, when I learned English, but you know, I was not a verbal person. Mm -hmm. Although my mother, my sister were, I yeah. was like my dad, you know? So that was the other, the other thing. I think if you're not, not a very verbal person, graphic, mm -hmm. you know, is a language that can Definitely. really, you know, help you to express yourself, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's um, also, you know, I, I also, found out when I was 12 that I didn't want to just be any kind of artist. My father yeah. wanted me to be a, like a commercial artist. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I, the only art that I could really do was one that came from my soul. This is what I discovered mm -hmm. age 12. Wow. Because uh, he paid for these like classes of this, like, you know, uh, over like, you know, male, male, whatever base art. And I realized then that I just couldn't draw just anything. It had yeah. to be something I really loved. Otherwise, it, come from, it would disappear. Yeah, it had to come from inside. It had to, it's it's well, kind of what you're describing is it had to be like a little piece of your soul that's kind of going out into the world. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just I couldn't just draw by command, you know. Yeah. So that, that was a very early beginning, like a really early understanding of the kind of art that I wanted to do. Which that's is amazing. Crazy. You know, most people don't know what they want to do by the time they graduate college. I mean, by the time they graduate high school, I mean. When you're supposed to go off into college and start who you're going to be as an adult um i know i didn't know what i wanted to be right after uh high school so you found this very early in life which is extremely amazing yes i'm gonna go ahead. Though, go ahead my parents opposed i mean my family didn't really you know my country being an artist was not a like a big thing it was like yeah. a you know it was like you know you were encouraged to be a doctor a lawyer you know go to university that not artists artists it was not something that we look, you know, the family looked well upon. Even, even, even all throughout my life, my family have had that struggle because they've never really felt that it was the right thing to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to be true to yourself. Um, that's one thing that this world will teach you is that you have to be true to yourself no matter what. Indeed. Indeed. I'm going to go ahead and share the works that are in a la carte. Um, so we have two of these large format Polaroids um, from the series, The Offering. So there's like a whole bunch, I can't remember exactly how many photographs are in that series, um, but we just have two. And I wanted to ask you um, to kind of give us a little bit of an idea of uh, where, like the themes and ideas behind The Offering. Yes, um, these very lush, you know, Polaroids um, began with, you know, I did, they were done in 2004 and um it was a time you know i was doing a lot of i be, was doing a lot of installations and mm -hmm. i was offered this opportunity to do these um wonderful photographs uh, which are very very expensive to do i don't know if you understand how the process of this is you oh, have yeah. to hire like a producer and, a, and an assistant it's like eighteen thousand dollars a day or something because the machine is like there's like only two in the world or something but i had a patron um Jennifer Johnson, who uh, invited myself and, and other artists, um, Carlos Betancourt, to you know her her home, and to to make these you know take this opportunity to make these photographs. And mm -hmm. it was you know it was interesting because I had to understand the the um, the medium. You know, mm -hmm. I had these ideas of making these large photographs with myself. I was uh, working a lot with um, you know with with the whole. Um, the idea of you know well voodoo in a sense you know some of the the of the concepts of it which are like the offerings to and also like i'm a catholic i was born catholic raised a catholic uh went to catholic boarding school age six yeah. and so the whole idea of you know sacredness and offering and you know a prayer this mm -hmm. is i would say it's a visual prayer mm -hmm. uh it is something that i was always working on um and, and the ideas those ideas i was working with at the time so given this opportunity, I realized that, you know, it, the medium worked best when you work up close, you know, it, mm -hmm. was, it was like something, I think that medium was really creative for like face close-ups and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work so well when I tried to do something in a landscape or something where my whole body, you know, was far away. It didn't, I didn't like it. So when I realized, okay, this is the way to go, 
-hmm. and I had like two days to be able to, you know, do all my work, all the, as many as I could, you know. So, um, so I would, you know, set up these 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 uh, environments and and photograph myself, you know, have myself photographed in them. Um, but you know, it, it, the idea basically is a visual prayer. Is a visual. It, it's the idea of offering um, what you offer you know, the gods or, or mm -hmm. your God um, in exchange for, you know, I don't know, whatever it is you want to pray it for, <laughs> you know? And I so in abundance also, yeah. abundance, you know? Yeah. And a lot of your work seems to deal with a spiritual nature um, in your work. Um, so that makes sense that it's, it comes from something maybe about your background. Um, we kind of, I think in the text panel, we talk a little bit about like this deity and the offering that you give to your deities um, and you're kind of this abundance nature of fruit that you're giving um, to, you know, as the offering, but also giving a little bit of yourself as the offering. Um, can you touch a little bit on that as well? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so it, you know, one of the other things that you could look at is also color coding, you know, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things like, you know, in the voodoo tradition, Mm -hmm. each paint has a color or, or okay. maybe one or two colors together so depending on the, the on the the deity you want to offer to you you know you, you have the colors their color their favorite colors because you know in a way there's seduction too you know mm -hmm. it's the idea of seduction of calling them to come yeah. to you so you're offering them but you're also trying to seduce them to come down and to you know be with you so you know, a lot of the times, you know, the colors would be like the, the white and the, in, and the, uh, and the blue, the Yemaya, you know, the pink for Ersuli, which is the love, you know, Yemaya has to do with, with the sea and also with love and women. And um, so, you know, it, it's, and each saint has their own food that, you know, you offer them as well. So I like, I like all those, those concepts. I, mm -hmm. I am not a, a, a voodoo practitioner as per yeah. se. I have studied it. I have um, really researched it because I wanted to understand it uh, coming from the Dominican Republic, which is an island, which is divided by with two countries, which is Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, and our past, you know, colonial past and our, in our, in our sort of relationship to each other to Haiti Dominican Republic because we've been in many times you know in crisis and wars yeah. and massacres and all kinds of things and I was living in New Zealand um in 81 to 86 um and I was really far away and I began to want to understand what was voodoo and what was catholic because Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we had it very mixed you know because because in the Dominican Republic voodoo had to be had to go underground uh, and okay. uh, when Trujillo did the massacre of the Haitians nobody would say that they practiced voodoo so mm -hmm. everybody it was in total denial even though a lot of Dominicans even though they're not like voodoo practitioners yeah there's a lot of that in our I say it's in your mother's milk you know I mean yeah. everybody kind of you know like my aunt would say to me oh when you were little when you were a baby you had the bad eye and my grandfather had to take me to some voodoo doctor to sort of do some ritual to get to get it up, you know? And yet, you know, they, if you ask them, do you believe in voodoo? No, of course not. And they're super Catholic. They're like, my aunt was almost a nun. But yet, you know, people still believe in these things. And I, as a, as a, as a, as a person, as an artist, I wanted to understand what was actually voodoo. So I started learning about voodoo and about African religions and tried to separate them from like what was Catholic and what was voodoo. Yeah. And in my understanding of it, also learning the history of the Dominican Republic, because I went, as I said, I left when I was 10 yeah. and I came back when I was 16, but I went to an American school. So I really hadn't learned that much Dominican history. So for me learning, oh, history. you know, the history, yet yeah, our history and the reason why these two countries were at war, mm -hmm. were always in, you know, why did Dominican Republic uh, deny this blackness? Why was there so much denial under mm -hmm. the Dominican Republic of this blackness? And, and recognizing that my own family, including my mother, who is the black person in my family, uh, you know, the safe hatred, uh, self-hatred and the denial of blackness. And so all of that took me on this incredible journey to understand the African, you know, religion, the culture, our history, yeah. and so I incorporate all of that research in my work. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, but I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be a teacher of it. I just like to, you know, use it to sort of share it with yeah. other people, you know, to make you want to think of well, what is this, you know, why is this this? And then hopefully you would go and, and find out a little bit more about it, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel that even though, you know, one does not necessarily have to practice uh, voodoo, it is a religion like any other. And it has, you know, I, to me, I respect it like anyone, anything else, because I think it's been given a lot of really bad publicity, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't think that, you know, I think it's it's a religion that has, to, you know, animate religion that has to, to respect for nature. Mm -hmm. and in many things like that so yeah popular I like culture definitely um tends to bastardize um out of the if you will normal religions and that's you know just because there's not like a great understanding of it and so they tend to make it out to be something it's completely not or they right. take certain things and make it um so far from what it the origin of it is that people don't have an understanding of it so they have one understanding instead of doing the research themselves to actually right. figure out what it is they just go off what maybe hollywood is telling you right um, zombie you know. <laughs> i mean you know there's this and there's bad characters in every religion you know i mean i think you can have you know bad things happen in any religion and you know if you take it for that you know only or you know some people see it as uh, you know uh, as um like being backwards you know like mm -hmm. um like the other day I, I i had invited a young dancer haitian dancer to participate in a performance that i was going to do and i thought he would be great and then he said no and all because i i, I spoke about voodoo and i spoke about rara -ra. yeah. and and his family was probably very you know religious in mm -hmm. another way like more like maybe anglican or whatever or you know protestant or catholic yeah. And the mention of Rara right there, the, the kid said no, you know, and he had said yes first. And then he goes, oh, I really can't. You know, I said, look, it's really not, you know, you're not going to be doing any rituals here. We just, <laughs> it, you know, it's more of a dance, you know, but yeah. <laughs> he, he, he didn't participate. So, you know, it just it, sometimes people you see it as hit. being associated with, with it as being backwards, and, you know, being or being um what do you call you know being like put into this idea that you know if you're haitian you mm -hmm. practice voodoo and therefore you're you know some sort of backward person and you know you know that sort of thing you know do you find so, that in your practice that you sometimes hit these roadblocks because um the types of you know themes and ideas within your work even though it is one thing you're trying to it's not like you're practicing it like you're saying you're just trying to acknowledge it acknowledge the history of it and put it into your work but do you find that you hit roadblocks with people when you discuss this um these types of elements within your work like voodoo and yes uh, very much so i mean for years you know i mean i i see now a lot of young you know, Af you know artists of color who are you know getting their work shown and they're you know they're being celebrated today because there's a lot of that today yeah. Um, and, but I've struggled with this for more than 30 years, you know, yeah. I mean, I remember uh, having these photographs in this fair and this um, collector who I won't name said to me, why do you hate black people, uh, white people? And I said, why do I hate white people? I said, this has nothing to do with hatred. It has, it has to do with love. You know, I'm showing these two beautiful black women, these photographs of these women who were like, young girls that were dressed in these like what their, their fineries you know mm -hmm. and like behind them was like a little shock but they looked like models in vogue you know they were so beautiful yeah. they were so beautifully you know the way they carried themselves and everything and how he could construct that i was you know hating white people because i took these photographs was beyond me but i don't know maybe somebody had told him that you know how people yeah. are yeah um but you know or like i had these one these these sculptures that had dolls in them Mm -hmm. And Africans, you know, use dolls instead of saints because they were not allowed to carve saints. So a lot of them used, you know, began to use dolls in, okay. in order to represent the saints. So I had these sculptures that these dolls were tied in, and it was really about, about the containment of, act, of, of, of uh, energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, it reminded me of babies and then you have babies and, or like, oh, you know, what are you doing to babies? <laughs> you know, so they would take it very literal. Yeah. And, you know, and so, you know, I, I've had 
I've had a lot of that all over my my career where you know painting people of color and and you know showing portraits you know with people of color and all that you know hasn't made me the most popular person I mean my work has always been very political mm -hmm. yeah um, you know it's not I mean you know, people think of it as just like you know um it's not decorative in a sense. It can be. It is, you know, can be very beautiful. But, but the the underlying um, ideas are political and not religious. They're more political you're also, because you're also an activist, which a lot of your work revolves around activism, and which I think is an extremely important. I think I think people are starting to accept it more now than they have in the past. So you've kind of paved the way for that type of art and you know the celebration of blackness that is now exactly. coming to the forefront of right. the art market and the art world um which you've right. helped pave the way for <laughs> that's right for many many years because when i was doing it you know it just basically not only in this country but in my country it even yeah. worse you know yeah. if if that was a hot issue here talking about haitians in the dominican republic is still a very hot issue you know yeah. It will even get you killed, you know, because people are there. Are a lot of people are very anti-Haitian, mm -hmm. and anything that's like pro-black, you know, even though we're black, you know, yeah. they, you know, they see it as pro-Haitian, and you know, and there's a lot of people who just uh, don't, you know, and th there's many reasons for it. I'm not gonna say, yeah, you know, that everybody has to, you know, love in Haiti, you know, it's a saintly country. No, you know, they've done harm to the Dominican Republic, and the Dominican Republic has done harm to them. So it, you know, it from either side, you know, you get the Haitians also not liking, yeah. you know, certain things, or like saying that, you know, what I'm, that if, that if I'm using voodoo, that I'm kind of like stealing it from them, as the Dominicans don't do voodoo, which isn't true, you know. Yeah. And my whole my whole um, statement is really about decolonizing. It's about understanding who we are, you know, you know, through knowledge, you know, through like if you cannot you cannot defend, you cannot be proud of something you don't understand you know my, uh, my for me from the beginning um the the thing to do was to you know to learn to go and learn history learn everything that i could about my culture and my history so that i could you know through understanding it be proud of it you know because if you don't know it anybody can tell you anything Exactly. And, and you, you know you just have to take it you know like when i was a kid they would call me his fat hip a uh, 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 spick you know, and what was what was that? You know, well, I'm Hispanic. So what's wrong with that? You know, so yeah. you know, what does being Hispanic means? You know, we, you know, we, we, the, the, his, you know, so so there's a lot of different, you know, things that if you understand them, they're they, they're they are not, um, they're not, you know, they're not going to hurt you. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. And so for me, that's been the big thing is knowledge, um, you know, understanding my history and and I and I'm always telling people to do the same and I have always um you know stood up to the idea that there you know that yeah that you know African Americans African the, the African diaspora needed to have a voice within uh, the contemporary um you know dialogue mm -hmm. uh and in both their presence in museums as well as their you know the presence of you know of, of in, in in any kind of uh um discussion and um you know so for me this has been my thing yeah and also but not only just doing the art but also um i've been uh, i've opened spaces i've had i've created i founded uh, edge zones which has um you know given opportunities to hundreds and hundreds of artists um we do an international exchange project where we take artists from america from Miami to not only mostly Dominican Republic, but not only Dominican Republic, I've taken them to China, I've taken mm -hmm. them El Salvador, Germany, all kinds of places, you know, Basel, we do a lot of things with artists from Basel. Yeah. So it's like, you know, two ways, you know. So it for me is is activism means also that, you know, to yeah. also uh, create opportunities and, and find funding for other people. Definitely. And I completely agree with that. And I think it's amazing that that is something that you've also been passionate about. And it's really interesting, um, you know, when I was doing research on you and reading about everything, you have done so much for the artistic community. Um, it's, it's truly amazing. And it's also just interesting to hear how your work 
has been a steadfast and it's been it's helped pave way for the way we are today. I mean, all of those themes and ideas that you still carry on today are very much in this work. You can either what I what I enjoy about the work is that the color and the the abundance of fruit is meant to draw the viewer in and to really look. And then once you look and then you just you you choose to understand, that's when the rest of it starts to unfold. And to me, that's what makes it really amazing work, really important work, really intel intelligent work, because um, it it grabs the viewer and then it holds the viewer and then the viewer chooses to to discover more. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly. That's what I hope you know happens. You know. Yeah. I um I look forward to um sharing this video with everybody. I wanted to thank you for giving me just a little bit of your time today and giving us a little bit more insight, not only into the works in a la carte, but also just into your artistic practice. Um, you're definitely a force. So I'm excited that I have gotten to meet you. <laughs> thank you. Likewise, Tina. Likewise.